upon the caregivers. I can give, tell you a, um, a story when we, after Hurricane Katrina, uh, when we were reestablishing, um, when we were working with school systems to reestablish schools and child care centers and all of those places, all of the teachers and caregivers had lost their homes, or most of them had lost their homes and were dealing with insurance companies and everything they had to do. I would assume there are some people in this room, since I'm in Florida, have been impacted by hurricanes and gone through this. So here they are with children, often children who weren't in their classroom before, who are you know, stressed out and with families that are stressed out, and then the teachers having to deal with it themselves. So we actually, with some of the training and support that we did for teachers, would come in and not just talk with them about trauma and the impact on children, but also what they could do for themselves and helping them learn some um, relaxation strategies, other types of strategies to help them deal with their, with their trauma. And it worked really well, and it's an important part. So self-care, which I'm going to talk about, is an important part of the work that all of we, that all the work that all of us do. This is a self-care type thing. You're networking, you're getting with people you don't see all the time, hopefully learning something that's valuable for your work and can bring back new knowledge. But this is a self-care. It's a different type of self-care than going to the beach or taking a walk or something like that. But important. OK, other risk factors for parents that certainly we have to pay attention to. Substance abuse, um, alcohol abuse, um, and how that impacts on parenting not paid enough attention to often. Um, <coughs> mental illness is something in depression that we, we hear about cases all the time. I'm sure many of you see cases. We see many cases. But depression is something that often um, people will not address. We see many parents bring in their children because there's some problem in the child and recognize over time the problem is really depression in the parent that they're not addressing and they're not willing to do it. So it's something we have to pay a lot of attention to. And then overall traumatization that comes from uh, dysfunction, stress, poverty, trauma, the interaction between poverty and trauma um, is a, a, a very important risk factor. We, I did a paper recently with Alicia Lieberman where we talked about a system of care related to infant mental health issues and infants and toddlers, but really a lot of emphasis on the, the uh, interface between poverty and trauma. OK, a little bit about brain development. If you're not familiar with the book, Neurons to Neighborhoods, A Science of Early Childhood Development, it was published in 1990 and just had its 10th anniversary. Um, it has been probably one of the most important contributions that we've had in terms of translating science of early child development into language that we can understand. What's come out of it, aside from that book, is a center, the Center for the Developing Child at Harvard. And I would recommend that you look at that website. You can just Google Center for the Developing Child at Harvard has a lot of materials on stress and trauma and architecture of the brain that you can download and um, read, distribute to other people. I use them a lot when I work with um, the multidisciplinary group of juvenile court for lawyers and judges and um, child welfare and early intervention, because it really takes science and makes it very understandable. So I would very much recommend that you look at that. So these are the major points that are made in the book, Neurons to Neighborhoods. All children are born wired and ready to learn. I think that's really important for us to, to understand. First few years determines how the brain develops. And there's a lot out there on brain development. I was at a conference yesterday, an NIMH conference, related to um, community partnerships and mental health. And um, there was a, a neuroscientist from Harvard presenting work. and I. I'm not a neuroscientist. I know a little bit about brain development. Um, I don't try to talk about the complex parts of it, but there are basic parts of brain development that all of us can understand. Relationships are very, very important. And relationships make a difference with brain development. We have to understand that that nurture and everything we do to help these families nurtures brain development. So neuroscience is very important. And if you go to that Center for the Developing Child, there's a fair amount there on brain development and architecture of the brain. I learned recently, and maybe you, you've heard this talked about architecture of the brain. 
And I learned recently where that came from, how they came up with the idea of architecture. It's because of the building blocks. And that, it seemed like a way to conceptualize it that made sense. OK, so this is what um, the effect of extreme deprivation on the brain. And what you see here in the abused brain is not as many neuronal connections. And that's what happens with exposure to trauma and abuse. And the way it happens and what happens, we have biology and environment shaping the brain, is through this pruning process. So there are, many, there, there are a number of neuro, neuronal connections that a baby comes into the world with. <laughs> And in early childhood, there are many, many more connections. And how they're pruned, how they develop over time, is based on experience. Take home messages. There's substantial evidence that poor nutrition, infections, environmental neurotoxins, drug exposure, and chronic stress can harm the developing brain. And um, mental health problems, parental mental health, substance abuse, and family violence. Um, have an enormous impact. We really need to pay a lot of attention to what we can do to help with that early environment. Um, influences on brain development, repeated exposure to traumatic stress, and brain development influences babies. Strong emotional relationships help brain development. And talking with and playing with infants and toddlers is the best way to support brain development. You know. Rarely the case that a maltreated infant has no symptoms. Interventions increase odds for positive developmental outcome. The developing brain has the ability to compensate for early deprivation, and early intervention can decrease. Also, you know, Selma Freiberg, who was one of the pioneers in the area of early development used to say working with young children working with babies is a little bit like having God on your side and the reason is that an infant's rapid development helps helps them they're changing all the time and so our stimulation and our responsiveness makes a big difference and it also helps the parent be able to tune into them and provide that sensitive, responsive care that the baby needs. So I'm not going to go into a great deal about the attachment relationship, but I just wanted to put up a slide um, related to secure attachment. If you have an infant who's securely attached, in the first year of life, by the second half of the first year of life, they differentiate their parent or primary caretaker from others in their environment and they start to develop a sense of security so by the second year of life they explore their environment they can separate they use their caregiver as a secure base and they're easily comforted when the caregiver um, returns so if we think about it for children who are in care where that separation occurs in the first year of life particularly the second half of the first year of life or the second year of life, how disruptive that is to the attachment relationship. And then if by chance we have multiple placement, it's not surprising that a four or five year old trusts nobody. So that's a main message about secure attachment. Now, one of the things that we do, I'm not going to use some of the other um, videos that I had thought about using because we don't have sound. But um, one of the things that I, I wanted to talk to you about that, that we do related to understanding the early relationship is we do what we call relationship-based assessments. And what we do is we observe the child in relationship with the parent or other caregiver, and we actually use a modification of the, uh, a uh, research-based assessment that was developed by Judith Kroll, but it's modified for clinical purposes. And what we do is we observe the child interacting during free play with a parent, and this is for children five years old and younger. And then um, we have them clean up, and then um, we have various structured tests. We always start with bubbles, which is really low stress. And if any of you are interested in the details of this, I'm glad to email it to you and give you more information. And then we have tasks with varying degrees of difficulty, starting with an easy one that's easy for them to do together, and then increasing degrees of difficulty. And then we have a brief separation and union, very brief, two minutes uh, separation reunion, just to see really what the reunion looks like. Now, if a child's been in multiple placements, and those we will not, will sometimes not do that. But what this relationship assessment tells us is 
um, not only how the child reacts,